Do you really need to be paying someone to adjust your engine's valve clearances in the 21st century? Or is this all just another example of naked dealership profiteering? I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com. And I get new cars cheap. Straight on the website. Card. Now, this report is in two parts, really. It's about what you need to do to keep your Mitsubishi Triton, which is called an L200 in some other markets, or your Pajero Sport 2.4 litre turbo diesel engine healthy. And it's also much more broadly across the entire information spectrum about where you should go for credible advice. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Living online is obviously awesome, but it's also kind of risky. You've really got to make sure you don't leave the door open to cyber attacks, data breaches and hackers. And that means you need to put some countermeasures in place now. Using NordVPN is a simple three-step process. You just choose a subscription, you download the app, and you connect to a NordVPN server. One click, and you are protected. NordVPN shields your IP address from scammers, and it secures your online traffic with state-of-the-art encryption across as many as six devices. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now, and you'll get up to four additional months free, plus you'll get Nord's rock-solid 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet, and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee every month to keep your data, your identity, and your devices secure. You'll be browsing online, shopping, listening to your favourite podcasts, and streaming video in complete privacy. And that includes plugging the holes in dodgy public Wi-Fi if you are connected remotely while travelling. All up, that's a pretty small price to pay for enhanced cyber security. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC now to get much safer online and enjoy those extra months of free NordVPN subscription time. It's totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thank you to Nord for sponsoring this episode. Fair dinkum, dude, I would love a hundred bucks for every day I have had an email question such as this. It's doubtful. I mean, I do love you in the most platonic possible way, but it's doubtful that were I paid that hundred bucks per incident, as discussed, I don't know that I'd be sitting here talking to you, just saying, like the Caymans is (laughs) calling to me. This is from Steve Thompson, who goes, quote, I own a 2018 Exceed Pajero Sport and have joined a Pajero Sport Facebook group in New South Wales. Excuse me briefly. (coughs) What do I think of that, really? Some of the members question the need to have the valves adjusted every 60,000 kilometres or 48 months, whichever. It's one word, dude. Comes first. Some of the Facebook experts, in inverted commas, so even Steve knows they're dickheads. Some of the Facebook experts think like some old school mechanics that an audible check, capital A, capital C, (laughs) is acceptable. So, Steve-o, there's your first problem. I'd suggest nothing on forums for a whatever, is of any value, right? Nothing on a forum is of any value because you don't have any way to know if it's credible or not, right? Because all information on forums is kind of democratically up or down voted and therefore if you're operating in a dickhead-rich environment, that democracy skews to median dickhead and that's kind of... Not where I'd go for advice on anything that matters. 
Just saying. In fact, I started looking on forums this morning when I decided to answer Steve-O's question and I wanted to give you an example of why. And I found pajeroforum.com.au and, you know... Off the bat, you'd have to say, oh, pajeroforum.com.au, it's probably fairly credible. It's about exactly what we're investigating here. And I found a guy, Dicko1, or one word, Dicko number one. I don't know, perhaps Dicko Head was already taken. Anyway, he was replying to a chap named, I presume a chap, could be a chapette, how would anyone know? But this personage was named... Dibby Dibby DJ, or one word, of course. Dicko One's icon, and he is officially a, quote, valued member of pajeroforum.com.au, whatever that means. His icon, his whatever, is Vladimir Putin's head with the cartoon scrotum beneath. I know. And I thought to myself about Dicko One, I thought, what an articulate child he must have been. What a creative child. All those conversations, all those meetings, those consultations between Dicko One's parents and the teachers going, I really think we should be considering school for the gifted for young Dicko One or any other school, mommy and daddy, just not this one kind of thing. So I thought, what can we glean from this? Well, if you're a, a parent or you're a young person looking to be credible or a parent looking to advise your young child about how to be credible, I'd suggest just take note of everything done by the likes of Dicko One on Fora and then just do the exact opposite and everything will work out okay. Dude. Now, here's what Vlad's head with its cartoon scrotum advised in this particular instance. Quote, Yep, and no tight valve makes a noise. And I struggled with that. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean yep, and no tight valve makes a noise? Or yep and no, tight valve makes a noise. Punctuation really does matter. Anyway, uh, Vlad plus scrotum goes on and says... Great way to blow a few dollars on a meaningless tap at diagnosis. Why people exist on taking their cars back to a Mitzi dealer is beyond me. Find a good private mechanic, just ask around. Well, one of the reasons people insist on taking their car to a Mitzi dealer, I'd suggest, is the 10-year warranty. Like, if you go back to the dealer once a year for your scheduled capped price servicing, you get another five years warranty. And then if some expensive component goes poopy in its trousers, they can't sort of diss you based on the fact that you, you know, didn't get your car serviced properly, because guess what? You did. So there's that. Anyway, steve goes on and goes, some have checked with their mechanics and been told it's a waste of time and money. That would be checking the tap at clearance, right? That an audible check with a cap A, go figure, is all that is needed. Now, we'll get into that in some detail in just a minute, but look, if you want an independent mechanic to have a look at your car, that's there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that in concert with getting the warranty extension to 10 years. And if you want, if you're in Sydney and you want to investigate that, there's a dude named Brett, I think it is, from MRT Performance in Sydney, and they do some really good work with Subarus and also that 2.4 litre Mitsubishi engine in the Triton and Pajero Sport. And I'd suggest reaching out to them. I don't have any commercial dealing with them. I've just watched a few of Brett's videos, and he knows what he's talking about. You can just tell. And there's that. So anyway. Steve-O goes on and goes, the service schedule shows check valve clearances one, if noisy, check valve clearance every year and every 60,000 kilometres, which means also every four years, right? So I downloaded the inspection schedule for said vehicle. It's here. It's dead easy to find on Google. And it basically just says you do an audible check 
every 15,000 kilometres or 12 months, whichever comes first. And then you do a physical inspection and adjustment every four years or 60,000 kilometres, which to me seems entirely reasonable. And we'll get into that anyway. Steve-O goes on, and I find this amazing. He poses a question at the end of this, but anyway, let's do that. He says, quote, Mine, we checked it, 48 months and 35,000 kilometres, so not a high mileage driver. Did it on the basis of time. Well done, Steve-O. And the dealer states on my invoice that exhaust tappets 1 and 3 were tight and inlet tappets 1, 2, 3 and 4 were also tight. Hmm. I suggest, Steve-O, that that is reality, reaching out through the invoice and grabbing you by the lapels and pulling you in and saying, dude, that was a really, really good idea to get that done because there is a Goldilocks aspect to valve clearances and too loose or too tight, that's kind of a problem because tight clearances in particular, they're a sensational way of breaking a rocker arm. And if you break a rocker arm, then you're likely to spoil the shit out of the precision ground face of the cam lobe and all other kinds of things can go wrong also, none of which are going to be free to repair, right? So I'd also suggest that rocker arm engineering is a real balancing act because they have to keep the cost down when they make a rocker arm. Like a rocker arm is like a seesaw, and so it's got a pivot that needs not to wear out when it's pivoting on its precision ground pin, and it's got a bit that follows the cam lobe and it's subject therefore just to the shear force of the cam operating on it continuously against the pressure of the spring and then there's the head of the valve stem which operates at the other end of the seesaw and it's quite a hard thing and the valve the rocker arm pivots on it like this which is not ideal from a wear point of view either so you need three really really hard bits but then the balance of the rocker arm which is a piece of pressed and stamped sort of steel that's presumably heat treated in at least three points so you've got to get that durable so not too hard for the body but then you need these hard spots so that the whole thing is not susceptible to premature wear that that, that is a design balancing act and they're not making them like in the aftermarket industry where you get a solid billet of whatever and you can put whatever in it they're stamping it out of a piece of steel because mass production and cost matters etc Steve-O goes on and says, I was told that the valves in these engines get tight, not loose over time like some other engines. I'd say anything's possible, dude. That's why you need to inspect it. But in general, valve clearances increase with time, although anything is possible because of the slings and arrows of operational vibration and all kinds of spooky things happen when something is subject to millions of impacts, which rocker arms are. So there's that. Steve-O finishes by saying, can you please clarify in a possible video outlining why this adjustment is required in these engines, if this is correct, of course. Regards, Steve-O. Okay, Steve-O. That's a reasonable question, I suppose, but the simplistic answer to all of this is that an engine is a properly complex item of equipment to design. It's the most expensive component from an R&D point of view in every car. And that's why engines tend to evolve over time as opposed to just be thrown out and replaced by brand new engines. Their shelf life is extremely long owing to the vast R&D cost of developing and deploying them. And this happens in a few different ways. And people get the wrong idea about this because they watch friggin' Avengers movies and they see Tony Stark going like this and 3D computer models moving around and he says, OK, Friday, do this or something. And that's not how it works. Like, there is some virtual design. They do FEA and they design all the components and make sure they all fit together and don't interfere with one another. But... Before too long, you have to build prototypes and figure out what goes wrong with the prototypes. And then after multiple iterations, you get to a final engine and you've got to subject that to all kinds of durability testing, right? And 
even that is such a specialised field. They put the engines in specialised test cells, which are glorified dynamometers controlled by computers, and they give it some operational profile and they feed it endless fuel. And because they don't want to wait 10 years or something for a result, they do what's called accelerated life testing. They put it through a severe operational protocol. And that just means they make sure the fuel tank is full and then they go away for the weekend and they come back and they hope the inside of the engine test cell doesn't have a dirty big mark where a conrod went straight through the wall, you know. And the engine typically operates between peak torque and peak power and just does all of these cycles like that. It's extremely harsh. It's impossible to drive like that in reality because you'd need a severely steep hill to drive against for 20,000 kilometres or something. And the only other way of doing it would be to go out in service and have a dynamometer on a trailer, like an artificial load, and just drive against that load continuously at like 4,000 RPM, wide open throttle, maximum accelerator. I know someone will say, oh, diesel engines don't have throttles. Most diesel engines do have throttles because they have EGR and you need the throttle for the vacuum to make the EGR work. But anyway, typically diesels operate unthrottled. I get that. That's what we're talking about, okay? So these brainiacs actually figure out what the servicing interval, what the individual servicing interventions are based on their accelerated life testing. And they do it in an environment where a whole bunch of bean counters and marketers are always going, nah, mate, nah, it's got to be a longer service interval, got to be longer, and it's got to be cheaper. So if anything, the service interval for your car is the minimum required intervention because the engineers figuring out what you should do are always at war with marketers and bean counters who want longer intervals and less servicing cost for the client, okay? So that's the simple answer for why you need to do this because if it was just a stitch up, or it was you could stretch it out more than that, I could just put a stethoscope on it every time and listen, then they wouldn't have a physical inspection requirement every four years. There's your simplistic answer about why do it. Because it's in the manual, and the manual is the minimum required, dude. Irrespective of what Vladimir uh, Putin's chin scrotum might think. And I have the utmost respect for tradies, I really do. Like anyone who's a mechanic, I'm an engineer... I've got respect for mechanics because mechanics are really good at what they do. Machinists, welders, all of that shit, they're really good at what they do. But they don't appreciate too much about engine design. They appreciate a great deal about in-service problems, right? Different thing. Complementary skills package, okay? I note that I have more respect for good mechanics typically than mechanics have for engineers. So, you know, that probably tells you something as well. Here's the detailed answer about why you need to check valve clearances. If the manual says it, you need to do it because. There are four components in this system, right? Let me just find a prop. There's a rocker arm, and up this end is a cam lobe that presses on it, tells the valve to open. So you've got the valve stem, the cam lobe, the rocker arm, and an adjustment mechanism. And the adjustment mechanism is really simple. It's like a grub screw with a lock nut. And you just get an Allen key, you loosen off the lock nut, you get an Allen key into the grub screw, and you change the clearance to the specified clearance, and then you lock it off again. It's an actual really simple but necessary process. And people think of it in isolation. They pull the rocker cover off an engine and they go, oh yeah, it's just a seesaw like this, okay? But it's not really, it's a bit more complex than that because it's a seesaw that needs to operate in a hot environment and that means the clearance that you put in here is not the operational clearance because metal expands when it gets hotter. So the clearance shrinks as the engine operates at its, as it heats up and gets to its operational temperature. Okay, And then you've got to realise that a 16-valve engine has 16 of these setups. So these are precision components, precision valve stems, a precision pivot, 
a precision contact surface, a precision cam lobe. Everything is precision. And there's four bits to it times 16 valves equals 64 different components that need to operate in this harsh environment continuously and reliably. So that's kind of a big deal. And if you think about a diesel engine doing something that we all take for granted, which would be operating at, say, 2,000 RPM, 2,000 RPM, you see the 2,000 on the taco and you go, yeah, that's easy for the engine. Dude, that is like, well, 6,000 RPM, okay, is 100 revs a second. So 2,000 RPM is like 33 revs a second, and for the camshaft, that's 16 revs a second. Now, I don't know about you, I can understand the mathematics of 16 revs a second for the camshaft, but you can't see it. It's too fast to see. It's too fast to log every one of those 16 revs per second, and it's too fast to gut feel. You know what I mean? It's just a mathematical thing. It's operating too fast for the human mind, right? And if you said to yourself that we're going to do let's say 10 revs per second in traffic, including being stopped at idle and then speeding up and whatever, and we're going to do 60,000 kilometres, which is four years of conventional operation, and we're going to do it at 30 kilometres an hour, that's like 2,000 hours, which is, guess how many revs of a camshaft that is, right? It's 72 million revolutions of the camshaft. And describing it as a revolution is not really accurate either because it's got a big bump on it. So when the camshaft comes up and hits the valve stem, it hits the rocker arm, so it rocks to hit the valve stem, it's really like a hammer blow, okay? And it's a hammer blow that's happening 10 times a second for 2,000 hours, which would be 72 million hammer blows. And the whole thing is operating at all times against the spring pressure of the valve. So this rocker arm is a highly stressed component that's subject to all of these impacts and resistive forces. There's also the fact that the valve has to operate so quickly, it's got inertia, so you're operating against what um, D'Alembert would call the uh, virtual inertial forces involved in accelerating it. Sigma F equals MA, if you understand Newton's second law, right? It's that. So this is a very complex, dynamic phenomenon, and it's happening 72 million fucking times, all right? And people can't even conceptualise 72 million because it's kind of a big number. If you drive from Sydney to Perth, right across the country, or LA to New York, if you're in America, that's about 4 million metres. So if you do that 18 times or nine return trips, that's 72 million metres. That's what 72 million metres of terrain looks like, okay? This is that in impacts on a rocker arm. Bang, 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 72 million times. To me, it just seems like an absolute miracle that you only need to check the clearances once every 72 million impacts. Like, that's an engineering miracle. Why they don't break every 10 minutes is beyond me. Like, like you can understand the mathematics, the FEA. You can, okay, they're the loads, good to go. But it's still kind of a miracle from a gut-feeling point of view because this is like being in a blacksmith shop and getting hit 72 million ways right, and not breaking, and not deforming, and just needing a minor adjustment. And the pro tip on this, like the absolute bonus points for all of this, is that the person who signed off on this servicing frequency, he never once went to work wearing Vlad P's face and a cartoon scrotum. So if that's not a really, really good reason to trust him, I don't know what is.